Hey guys, what's up? Hello and welcome to episode 17 of the Forward Progress Football Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Party, and today we're going to be continuing our Who Are They series, today doing the Miami Dolphins. Let's get things started. Okay, so in case you guys are new here, I go over each team uh, position by position and give a general roster overview while also asking some questions that I want to have answered throughout the season. At the end, I'm going to do a season projection while I, where I will give a pessimistic and optimistic win total, um, talk about their Vegas over-under, whether or not it's a smart bet or not, and then give the team's biggest strength and biggest weakness. And then at the end of this entire series, I will be doing a full season projection along with a playoff prediction after that. And as I said in today's episode, we are doing the Miami Dolphins. Super exciting team with a lot of upside, but definitely got a bunch of question marks too. That's starting with the quarterbacks. They got Tua Tagovailoa, uh, Teddy Bridgewater, and Skylar Thompson. So Tua was drafted in the um, first round a couple years ago, number five overall, and hasn't quite lived up to that billing yet. Um... He struggled with injuries, and then he's also just struggled keeping the backup on the bench, frankly, whether it was Jacoby Brissett or um, Ryan Fitzpatrick the year before. He tends to be pretty accurate when hitting his first read, but inconsistent when going farther in the progression and when not on an RPO play. He so far, though, has been hamstrung by a pretty terrible offensive line, but after grabbing a few pieces in free agency, this year should at least have like a semi-competent group in front of him. Um as well as getting Tyree Kill, arguably the most impactful receiver in the game. It's all on two and out to show that he is able to elevate the poor play of the offensive line in front of him, while also taking advantage of the amazing group of weapons he has in front of him. Um, Teddy Bridgewater looked like he could be the Vikings quarterback, of the like the franchise quarterback a few years ago, but then in a non-contact injury, his knee just got completely destroyed, and... Along with his knees, his changes with the teams were also destroyed. It took him years to see the field again, and even more years to be a starter. And since he's been a starter again, he's been a pretty accurate conservative quarterback, but he has a alarmingly high amount of turnovers and turnover-worthy plays, which you typically don't see from this conservative type of quarterback. Um, I think he's just a backup at this point, but we'll see with Tua's history if he does see some playing time. And then Thompson is likely a career backup type, drafted in the seventh round. Maybe we'll make the roster, maybe not. We'll see. So for running backs, they have Chase Edmonds, Raheem Mosert, uh, Sony Michelle, Miles Gaskins, and then Alec Ingle and John Levitt, or Lovett at fullback. So the Dolphins have a pretty nice rotation work here with all four of the running backs having a lot of experience. Last year with Arizona, Edmonds... Uh, he was a part of that rotation there with him and James Conner and had just under 600 yards off of 5.1 yards per carry, so a pretty good efficiency to go along with 43 receptions and 311 receiving yards. Wouldn't be surprised if he was like the main back here, but as I said, that's going to be a pretty heavy rotation, especially if uh, Raheem Mostert can stay healthy. He struggled with injuries throughout his career, but his killer speed makes him a valuable weapon for um, any offense, especially coming from San Francisco to this San Francisco system that McDaniel will be running. Um, he has a career of 5.7 yards per attempt to go along with a 37% uh, breakout breakaway percentage, which is when a run is greater than 15 yards. So he'll be their big play threat if he can stay healthy and likely won't see a bunch of touches, but when he does, expect, expect them to go far. Then Michelle, uh, last year, quietly had almost 900 yards with the Rams, falling just short of 1,000 when you add up his receiving yards to that. He definitely can get the job done, but will he see much playing time with how deep this rotation is? Um, we'll see about that. And is he just here, though, in case of injury, especially with Mostert ahead of him? And then Gaskins, he started a lot of games with Miami last year, but it's arguably fourth fiddle on this squad, which speaks to how well this team prioritized um, attacking this running back position and having a strong run game to complement Tua and this crazy offense that could potentially be there. Um, Gaskins is nice now just out in the back pocket, but everyone else just kind of brings more explosiveness, juice, upside, stuff like that. He likely won't see too much playing time unless there are injuries ahead of him. And then while most offenses don't use the fullback position much, the Shanahan one 
that McDaniel is bringing over definitely does. Um, that's why they brought in Ingold, who with the Raiders have been one of the best receiving fullbacks in the league before tearing his ACL in Week 10. Um, this is a small sample size, but Ingold had 1.85 yards per route run last season compared to two receivers on, or two players on the Dolphins roster. Gasecki had 1.45 yards per route run, and Jalen Waddle had 1.75. Like, obviously, Ingold was not running nearly the amount of yards or routes as the other two, so there is the sample size skewing, but he is able to get the job done and look for him to be the use check of this offense and potentially be the next best fullback for the next five years in an offense that probably will feature him a lot. Um, love it. He's probably going to be a practice squad stash just in case Ingold gets injured or something like that. I don't really see him. I'll be surprised if he kind of made the roster just because two fullbacks is a lot to have. And then wide receivers. You got Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, Cedric Wilson, Eric Uzakanma, uh, Lynn Bowden Jr., Trent Sherfield, Preston Williams, Cody Kaur, River Crackcraft, uh, Devontae Dedman, and Braylon Sanders. So, man, this offense is going to be fast. Adding Tyreek to this group is crazy, and as a true number one, potentially the most impactful wide receiver in the league due to his speed, this offense could be like game-changing like at this speed. Uh, we'll see if Hill can help unlock Tua and this offense and make it crazy, or if Tua's just limitations that he's shown so far in his career is just going to hold the offense back. Last year as a rookie, Waddle had 104 catches, which is like crazy high. However, he only had 1,015 um, yards and a dot average depth of target of 7. Compared to Tyreek, who throughout his career is 12, that just shows how much this offense last year was predicated on short game, quick passing attack. Um, it was not due to the offensive line or to his shortcomings. I guess we'll see that more a bit this year. Um, there was also a very RPO-centric offense that got the ball out of Tua's hands almost ASAP. We'll see if McDaniel will open up the playbook here and let Tua rip it to Hill and Waddle, as they may potentially be the two best deep threats in the league right now, while also both having the ability of high-volume receivers. Um, this offense could be truly like game-breaking if Tua does hit and becomes the quarterback worthy of the number 5 overall pick. There's just a lot riding on that. And then with Gallup struggling with injuries in Dallas last year, Cedric Wilson saw a lot of time, especially out the slot. Now in Miami, we'll see if he's still going to be like a primary slot receiver, as both Hill and Waddle are capable in the slot too. Um, last year, he finished with 600 yards, 6 touchdowns, so we'll see if he can repeat the same kind of success as probably the 4th receiving option, maybe even 5th behind the running back here in Miami. Um, as Ukonoma played mostly outside receiver for Texas Tech. He was drafted in the fourth round this year. We'll see if he's able to do anything year one or if he's going to be more of a piece down the road. Um, Bowden missed all of last year with injury and barely played a role in this offense a year before, uh, mostly getting playing time as a slot. We'll see if he can carve out a role in this offense. I see he's kind of had a weird career so far, to say the least, being drafted by the Raiders in the third round and before preseason being traded for a fourth round pick. Um, so we'll see if he sticks around and turns into this great gadget player that the Raiders and a lot of the league envisioned him as, or if he's just going to continue to be buried in a depth chart. And then they have a lot of other wide receivers here as depth, so we'll see who's able to stick around. Um, Williams is intriguing because he looks pretty good as a, a undrafted free agent in 2019, but then every year since then his production has gone down and down. Um, everyone else who is on this roster currently are UDFAs, from throughout the years, other than uh, Crowcraft, who was drafted in the 6th, and then Deadman and Sanders are both UDFA rookies this year, so that might give them a leg up, just the youth and being like, oh, like, the potential for growth there. So for tight ends, this team has Mike Gusecki, uh Durham Smythe, Adam Shaheen, and Hunter Long. Gusecki is more of a bigger-bodied slot than a tight end, a glorified receiver, if you will, he is one of the best receiving tight ends in the league, but has yet to have a big breakout season like many have expected him coming in the second round a couple of years ago. Um, would he be able to do this season with all the talent 
around him drawing double teams take advantage of that and have a breakout season? Or will it continue to be more of this complimentary piece that's nice to have but not necessarily a must-have for this offense? Um, it's also to note that in San Francisco, Kittle was an exceptional blocker. Gusecki is not. As I said, he's more of a glorified wide receiver. So maybe this team is planning on moving on from him if he can't show that blocking prowess. Um, He's just playing on the franchise tag this year, so there is the option to get out. And then Smythe is Miami's true tight end, drafted in the same class as Gusecki just a bit later on. Smythe is used much more as an inline tight end and as a blocker, and has been having a steady progression each year, something you like to see. Shaheen plays about half his snaps in line, half of them in the slot or out wide, so he's a good depth piece to have as he can play both Kaseki's role and Smythe's role, able to plug in in case one of them goes down. And then Long was drafted in the third round last year, possibly to replace Kaseki, who is, as I said, playing on the franchise tag this year. It'll be interesting to see if he's able to push his way up the depth chart and make it an easier decision for the Dolphins on what to do with Kaseki. Right now, he's kind of buried on there with some very solid tight ends ahead of him, but as a third round pick... Um, You expect him to start playing sooner rather than later. So along the offensive line, um, their starters right now project to be Teron Armstead, Connor Williams, Michael Dieter, Robert Hunt, and Liam Eichenberg. With their backup tackles including Austin Jackson, Greg Little, Larnell Coleman, Adam Pankey, Keon Smith, and Kellen Deesh. Their backup um, guards, and I'm assuming some of these guys can also have flexibility at center. Um, Robert Jones, Blaze Andrews, Solomon Kinley, and Cole Van Wart. So Tron Armstead is one of the best tackles in the league, but he has struggled with injuries every year and isn't getting any younger. So can he manage to stay healthy this season and continue to play at such a high level at age 31 with a new team? Um Great signing, one that they definitely should have made, but there is still a lot of question marks around it. Austin Jackson, he's disappointed as a former first-round pick and was even kicked into guard at times last season to see if his play would improve there, which it didn't. So with Miami's guard situation likely locked up between Hunt and Williams, um, we'll see if Jackson can compete for right tackle with Eichenberg or if he's just going to be kind of like a backup swing tackle or um, plug-and-play guard. And... He probably will get playing time this season, just as I said, Armstead, he has not been able to stay healthy, so maybe Jackson will play in like two or three games at left tackle, we'll see about that. Um, Greg Little, he looked promising coming out of Ole Miss, being drafted as the at the top of the second round of 2019, but after two injury-riddled seasons where he didn't look good even when he was on the field, he was traded to Miami for a seventh round pick, seventh round pick and spent the year on their IR. So now he'll have the chance to compete. Uh, right tackle would be the back of swing tackle, similarly to Jackson, but he hasn't really shown any optimism that he can make that happen. And then Coleman was drafted in the seventh round last year, hasn't really had any playing time. We'll see if he makes the practice squad or gets cut, what happens there. Um, Williams, he's had an up and down first four years in Dallas as their guard, but now hopes to find his footing here in Miami. However, Williams was surrounded by better line play with the Cowboys, which typically helps the lineman hide his weakness. Um, And he obviously wasn't able to do that there. So we'll see if he can maintain his level of play in Miami or if he ends up regressing. Jones was a UDFA last season, but made a couple of appearances at guard and tackle for the Dolphins, including a pretty poor start at right tackle in week 18. But he is young, he could improve, so having him stashed to cover injuries isn't like a bad mood or move or anything. And then Andrews is a UDFA this season, so we'll see if he can stick around. Um, Dieter, he struggled with injuries, including missing about half of last season on the IR. But he did have his best season when he was out there. We'll see if he can continue to grow and improve while um, playing. And as I said with Williams, when the talent around you is better, it's easier to look better. So we'll see if that stays true. Um, and then Hunt has started at tackle and guard for Miami looking better at guard but also looking well at tackle so maybe the best offensive line is kicking Hunt back out to tackle Um, but right now I see him most likely playing guard and then Eichenberg over at tackle we'll see if he can continue to grow now though in year three that's typically when a lot of linemen explode Um, and then Kinley he started in at guard in 2020 as a rookie but then was benched last year after two games so 
likely just a depth piece for Miami, being unable to start on like one of the worst offensive lines last year. Um, but it's kind of crazy that he was able to start as a, I want to say, a late-round pick in 2020 as a rookie. You don't typically see that happen too much. Um, Van Wert went undrafted last year out of Iowa, and he has guard center flexibility when he did play at Iowa. So if anything happens to Dieter, I would expect him to play. Um, no one else I've seen take snaps at center, but maybe like some of them have that in their back po- pocket, whether at college or they just have the ability to. And then Eichenberg, he started almost every game last year, I think every game but one, other than left tackle and right tackle, but he had his struggles. He is a rookie, though, um, so hopefully this year, year two, he can take his next step forward. We'll see about that. And then Pinky, Smith, and Deesk are all bas- backup types who went undrafted, um, Deesk being undrafted in this class, so we'll see who, if any, will stick around and make this roster as some depth. So for Miami's interior defensive line, they have Christian Wilkins, Raekwon Davis, Zach Seiler, Adam Butler, John Jenkins, Ben Still, Benito Jones, Jordan Williams, DeAndre Johnson, and Owen Carney Jr. Wilkins, he definitely had his best season as a pro last year, posting 31 pressures and 5 sacks to go along with some pretty great production against the run. So can he continue to improve against the pass, or is he going to be like many defensive tackles where he's just like a primary run defender? That was his concern coming out of Clemson a couple of years ago, that he wasn't going to be able to do much against the pass. But it's looking like he's kind of coming into his own there, and hopefully he can continue to improve. Um, And then after looking pretty good as a rookie, Raekwon Davis took a step backwards definitely last year in year two. Um, he plays like an undersized nose tackle, only around like three, three ten pounds, which is small, oddly enough, for playing that zero or one tech. Um, so was he just kind of being deployed incorrectly last year, and is that hurting his growth? Is um, with Brian Flores out, but they're keeping the same defensive coordinator? Is that going to change how the defense is ran and change so that? davis isn't put in these situations or are they going to trust what they saw his rookie season and be like no he's able to produce like that just for whatever reason last year he didn't and then siler has grown since being a seventh round pick back in 2018 last year was his best year yet having a bit less pressures and sacks but off many less snaps than his year before um so looking good last year will he see his snap count rise up again especially if davis struggles um Butler, he also has played some undersized nose tackle for Miami last year, rotating with Davis, but he also didn't have that good of a season. So we'll see if he can turn that around and maybe push Davis for that starting job. Jenkins, he's been a journeyman rotational defensive lineman, stronger against the run than a pass. He'll probably provide some early down run support for this team, but not really much more. And still, Williams, Johnson, Carnies are all undrafted free agents this year um four guys in the same position that kind of tells you what you they think about the depth of this group um trying to get uh, bulkier there and then benito jones he's just been a backup since being undrafted two years ago in 2020 all right at edge defender the dolphins have emmanuel ogba andrew van ginkle jalen phillips melvin ingram brennan scarlett sam egovan I don't know if I said that correctly, sorry. Cameron Good, Darius Hodge, and Deshaun Hall. So this edge group is full of interesting different types of rushers that allows this front to be very multiple and um, take advantage of our like, kind of Belichickian scheme that they run. And after bouncing around early in his career, Ogba definitely found his footing here in Miami, having back-to-back seasons with over 60 pressures and double-digit sacks. He's definitely kind of almost of the number two type like ideally like he's been a good number one for them but if they can find someone to be the true number one and Ogba be kind of like the compliment to him that would be his ideal situation and they might have that brewing here um Van Ginkle he can rush the passer or drop back into coverage he's the true like Belichickian edge rusher um he has success in both with about 15 percent of his rushers uh resulting in pressures and holding his own for the most part when dropping into coverage he definitely is an excellent at either skill but his versatility helps keep the offense guessing is a useful tool to have but if anyone's going to be the number one pass rusher like a true number one on this team it's going to be Jalen phillips last year he finished with 10 sacks which is great for a rookie of course however 
if he wants to keep that up, he's going to have to step it up with the pressures, having only 39 this year. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if he took a nice step forwards in year two and was the best true edge rusher on this team. Uh, Ingram, he's definitely lost a step as he's gotten older, but having him as your fourth edge is pretty good. He can step up in case of injuries or just help the other guys around him get an injury or get a breather while still having pretty good production against the pass. Um, Scarlett is another one of these hybrid edge linebackers similar to Van Ginkle, um, but he is primarily like someone who they come in on early downs, run downs to play um, help against the run. And then Yugovan is also in this hybrid mold, but is more of a pass rusher than a run stuffing edge. And Good was drafted in the seventh round this year, and Hodge went undrafted last year. Um, Hall, he bounced around and struggled with injuries recently, not getting a lot of snaps really since 2019. We'll see how many of these bottom of the death um, chart guys will make the roster. As this, that is a pretty deep group. So for linebackers, the Dolphins have Jerome Baker. Elandon Roberts, Channing Tindall, Duke Riley, and Calvin Munson. Um, Baker, he's like a modern-day linebacker, small and fast, and definitely better against the pass than the run. And then El- Landon Roberts hasn't really been anything special in his first year, two years in Miami, but hasn't been like a defensive liability or anything. Um, Channing Tindall is the upside play here. He's a really explosive linebacker, um, drafted in the third round out of Georgia this year. He's got to definitely improve on the, some technical aspects in the game, and he's more of a straight line speed rather than a change of direction sort of um, quick guy. But physically, he should become a starter here sooner rather than later, hopefully replacing Roberts there. Um, Duke Riley was drafted by the Falcons to be like a Deion Jones backup or just having two Deion Jones out there for coverage downs, but he definitely has not really been that so far. Um, after two years there, he got traded to Philly and... Looked better there and in Miami last year than he has in Atlanta, but um, kind of good that he's your fourth linebacker here playing only in like dying, passing downs, the backup caliber player, you know. And then Munson was picked up midseason last year, only played three snaps. We'll see if with such a small number of linebackers, they just keep him around for depth and if he gets some more playing time this season. At cornerback, they have Xavier Howard, Byron Jones, Nick Needham, Noah Igbenogany, Keon Crossan, D'Angelo Ross, Quincy Wilson, and Elijah Campbell. So, naturally, Xavier Howard regressed a bit last year after posting an amazing 2020 where he included um, 10 interceptions. Still, Howard had 5 picks last year and a pass rating of 88, which is pretty alright when targeted. Um, hopefully he can get closer to his peak form again, as I was more of a low-end number one type season. But even in a down year, Howard is a solid cornerback to have on your roster. And then Pyron Jones playing opposite of Howard helps us to be one of the best duos in the league, especially if they can both hit um, their peaks at the same time. However, Jones hasn't yet recaptured how good he was when he first transitioned to corner from safety for the Cowboys. We'll see if he can recreate that or if he's going to stay more of just like a quality number two corner, like someone who you aren't worried about on your roster, but someone who the offense isn't like necessarily sweating about. Uh, Nick Needham, he started for the Dolphins since being an undrafted pickup in 2019. These past two seasons, he's primarily played the slot and should likely win that job again. He hasn't been like a game-changing slot or anything, but he does his job well, especially considering how he wasn't drafted. The same cannot be said about Igbenogheny, who was drafted 30th overall in 2020. So far, he has not been a starter and hardly played at all last year. However, he will only be turning 23 in November, so there's plenty of time for him to enter his prime. However, as of now, it seems like he's going to be buried on this death chart. And then Crossan, Ross, Wilson, and Campbell are all like versatile defensive backs who can play corner, slot, safety... Um, as I said, this defense is very multiple, left in the front and in the back. So we'll see who Miami does decide to keep out of them to fill up this depth chart. At safeties, um, the Dolphins have Javon Holland, Brandon Jones, Eric Rowe, Trill Williams, Clayton Fehedelum, Sheldrick Redwine, and Verone McKinley the third. So Javon Holland was one of the best safeties in the league last year, and that was as a rookie. 
So we'll see if he can continue to impress in year two, which I do not doubt he can. Um, Jones, he played a lot last year as more of like a box safety complimentary piece to Holland. He got, um, he's got a ways to go in coverage, but he looks to have like a good complimentary skills set to Holland. Him and Rose split time last year as the second safety, or they both played at the same time in three safety sets. We'll see if the former third round pick in Jones can firmly take his seat as the second safety entering year three now. And then after not performing the best as a corner, Rowe has found his footing here in Miami as a safety. He plays more so as like a box or a slot than a true like deep safety, so he will make a great third safety who's plenty good enough to be the second if Jones isn't able to step up. Um, Williams last year, he was an undrafted free agent, barely played, we'll see if he gets more playing time this year. And then Fahedalem has experience playing both over the top and in the box, so a pretty solid depth piece to have, but someone who Miami probably hopes doesn't see the field too often. And then Redwine hasn't impressed so far heading into year four on his third team already after being drafted in the fourth round, and then McKinley is an undrafted free agent, so both of them are going to have to fight to make these roster spots. All right, so for the special teams, Miami has Jason Sanders at kicker, Tommy or Thomas Morstead and Tommy Heathery competing for the printer job and Blake Ferguson at long snapper. So after an amazing 2020 where Sanders hit 20, 92.3% of his field goals, um, he definitely took a step back this past season, only hitting 74.2%. However, four years into his career, he hasn't missed a kick under 30 yards, not including um, PATs, and has only missed a three under 40 yards. And then Morstead has spent a solid eight seasons in New Orleans, looking like one of the be better punters there before splitting his time last year with the Jets and the Falcons. Um, this year, he hopes to stick around with Miami, but he will have competition with Tommy Heatherly, uh, undrafted free agent rookie out of FIU. And then Ferguson was drafted in the 2020 draft in the sixth round to Longstaff. Don't see many of guys like that get drafted, so... Good for him. Get his money and a uh, pretty secured roster spot there. So now times for my season projection. As I said, I'm going to give a pessimistic and an optimistic overview of these rosters. And when I do so, I'm going to talk like some of the extremes that can go wrong. If all these things go wrong or right, um, the records obviously will be worse or better than this. This is just like I don't see Miami, like all these things compounding enough to where Miami wins less than seven games or more than 11 games um, unless due to injuries, of course. Then I'm going to talk about their over-under and then their biggest strength and weakness. So speaking on the pessimistic first, um, I think their floor as a team right now is a 7-10 and 10 season. Some things that can go wrong include Tua being unable to take the next step as he continues to look just all right before a poor offensive line, which also keeps the question that is that Tua's fault or not, which you don't want to be wondering at the end of year three. You want to know whether or not he's the guy. Um, the running back room is still unspectacular despite the few, despite the new additions, and they're also hit with an injury bug, a couple of injury-prone guys there. Um, and then while Hills and Waddle's speed is nice, they're unable to find a way to use them in a complementary way um, as they have like the same skill set almost. And in an offense that needs to get the ball out fast due to quick pressure and to his weaker arm, they're unable to capitalize on the threat of the deep ball that they provide. Armstead, he continues to battle with injuries, and the patchwork they tried to fix this offensive line is unsuccessful as they continue to be one of the league's worst. No one really progresses along this defensive line, and Davis continues to struggle playing that undersized nose roll. These edge rushers also provide more of the same, which you can see the potential of them being great, but they just aren't quite hitting it, aren't quite unlocking it. Uh, the linebackers, they're un, uh, just fine, unable to be like a huge noodle mover. It's tough to do as linebackers. And at corner, Howard and Jones continue to look just like a fine duo instead of this elite pair that they're paid to be and have the shown the potential of in the past. Um, Holland, he has a bit of a sophomore slump, as a lot of players tend to do. I honestly don't see this happening, but that's just something that can happen. Um, often just figure him out a bit more and take advantage of his weaknesses. And neither Rowe or Jones really wow at safety too, kind of just rotating between the two throughout the year, trying to find the right fit. 
Um, optimistically, though, I think this team can reach like an 11 and 6 season and a tough AFC East and AFC in general. Um, things that can lead to that is two are taking strides in year three and a quarterback friendly offense with great weapons and an improved offensive line. The running back room is nice with everyone staying healthy and the different skill sets meshing well and allows them to all be maximized. Um, Hill and Waddle look like one of the league's best receiving duos, uh, decimating defensives with their killer speed, and Gaseki balls out as a complimentary piece on the franchise tag. On defense, Wilkins continues to improve, and Davis looks like his rookie self more so. Um, Phillips continues to get better second year as a former first-round pick, looking like true number one edge potential, and Ogba stays that like really solid high-end number two sort of guy with a healthy rotation generating pressure. The linebackers are solid in the middle against the pass and don't get put in many compromising situations against the run as they are smaller, so you want to kind of protect them. Um, and they do. Miami can do a good job at that. At corner, Howard and Jones, they return to their peak form, playing like the best cornerback duo in the league, and Holland continues to be a top-tier safety and Jones has like a year three breakout. So right now their over under is set at a pretty tough spot. But if I had to pick a win total for them right now, it probably would be nine games. It's barely missing the playoffs. Um, so I don't really see this team taking a step back, especially with an improved offense. Probably a step back on defense, but this offense I think will help compensate for that. It mostly just depends on Tua and then also like a back-breaking five-game stretch um, to close out the season. They have to go to San Francisco, to LA to play the Chargers, to Buffalo, then they come back, host Green Bay, and then go back to New England before closing out the season with the Jets. Um, so I feel like that's going to be their time to show what like who they really are. If they're able to win a couple of those games and prove like, hey, we are a playoff team, we are able to make noise then they're definitely hitting that over, but yeah, that's the that's the part that scares me on it. And then their biggest strength, I put it speed. This team definitely has the chance to be the fastest NFL history with Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, and Raheem Mostert all having true game-changing speed. If this team is going to be one of the league's best, um, it'll be because of how this offense uses, utilizes speed threats, including getting easy short stuff because of the way all the defensive backs will have to be playing deep to protect against the deep bomb that will inevitably be there this season. And then their biggest weakness, I'm still going to put it this their offensive line despite their attempts to improve it. Uh, their offensive line was a mess last year, and while it should be improved, I still worry about it holding the squad back. Armstead should be fine at left tackle, but it's been years since he played a full season. William Seaside is concerned while in a good surrounding situation, and now in Miami, that definitely could look a lot bleaker. Um, Dieter started because they didn't really have anyone else to trust, and while Hunt has looked good so far, it is at guard, and that is one of the most, like least impactful positions on the offense. And then Eichenberg is also only in year two and wasn't anything special as a rookie. So you're expecting a lot of these young guys to step up and improve, as well as Armstead hanging, uh, staying healthy, but that is a lot to ask for, and I'm just worried that we will not see that come to fruition. All right, guys, thanks for sticking along. Um, leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you're on YouTube. It really helps get the video out there, and if you're on Apple, Spotify, wherever else you might be listening to this podcast, leave a review. Um, I'll try to get a video out in the next couple days, breaking down the third team in the AFC East. And yeah, see you guys all next time.